and welcome to the green room. We have artists who have exhibited in Antarctica. We have Joyce Campbell, Cheryl E. Leonard, and Judith Hersko. Welcome. Oh, we want Antarctica. So I know that you're in, uh, like you're in the States and New Zealand, but as far as we're concerned, no, no, you're the Antarctica artist. So, <laughs> I don't think so, I can uh, represent. So. It's been so long, but um, uh, it feels in a while. I'm just to represent Antarctica, but that's okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll do our best. Yeah, yeah, we'll do our best. What is it like in Antarctica? I mean, I imagine well, it's cold, but. We were in different places, I think, right? Mm -hmm. um, I was on the peninsula at Palmer Station and during the austral summer, and it was it was fairly warm for Antarctica. Um, like it would get above freezing. And mm -hmm. it was actually quite noisy. So there was a lot of wildlife um, breeding in the summer. So the penguins and the seals and the other birds. Um, it was nice not to have airplane noise. That was interesting. And I was also surprised at how colorful it was on the little patches of land that were exposed where the ice has melted back. There's this brilliantly colored lichen and mm -hmm. patches of green moss and even a little bit of grass. Really? So my experience wow. of, of Antarctica was probably quite different from what you guys had. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, uh, one thing that stood out to me, I was at McMurdo Station, so that's more on sort of volcanic uh, gravel, uh, not, not, not as much vegetation, even though not everything is covered in snow or ice. Um, it's more like black sort of gravel, which I actually brought back that figure that's on my website is made from that. So I, I, oh. I, they, let, they let me bring back, the, so, so one of the black figure is from that, Antarctic uh, gravel. Um, so anyway, um, what I, what's one thing that stood out for me? There is Mount Erebus that is is mm. nearby there, and yeah. no matter where you went, and I went really far because they took me out to the dry valleys, and I I went to different places. Always, it looks like it's nearby. So many people have perished because one of the things that are very different in Antarctica, you don't have the kind of vegetation that humanity human beings have evolved around. So we have no reference points. You have no reference points for distance because you don't see trees or things get that get smaller in the distance. So you get sort of lose your sense of distance and perspective. And also the air is much cleaner. So you don't get aerial perspective either. You don't get that sort of smoggy feeling in the distance. So there are two ways in which you don't, you don't judge distance the way we do having, you know, evolved in the savanna, you know, around trees and vegetation that we can, that, that we measure distance and our own size with. So there are lots of perceptual oddities with that, aside from just all the white stuff in the, you know everywhere. But it was an unusually warm summer there. I was there the same time as Cheryl, except on the other end of the continent. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was literally so warm that I had, so the other thing about McMurdo is that it's like a military base. Mm -hmm. Basically, it's yeah. ugly. It's very, very ugly. Were, Joyce, were you there also? No, I was at Scott Base, but we flew into McMurdo, so we will have yeah. had quite similar experiences. We're in a similar yeah. terrain, and the militarism of of McMurdo and and the social aspects of that were fascinating. It is in, it is relentlessly social. That's it what you're so hearing. Funny. You think you're going to be alone, but you're not alone. You are just like jam packed with people. Oh, yes. like, uh, because seriously, it is just like people wall to wall and intense people. Like at, at, at McMurdo, it's a lot of scientists, but they send a lot of the drillers to Ross, but to, to, to Scott Base, the New Zealand base. Oh, like, cre creatively, mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's creatively, is that like kind of a hostile environment? You're trying to be like serious about your work and you want to come back with the gold. Like, you know, you want to come back and be like, so I didn't sleep. The world. I, I basically didn't sleep for two weeks. I basically just stayed up because it was 100% sunlight. The light was best in the middle of the night. I just worked all the time and there were always people around and you can't get away from people because you're not allowed to be alone. So oh. I had a different experience because um, I was at a much smaller station. So the station I was at had 33 people when I was there and we had more freedom. But we you were couldn't allowed to go out. 
in boats, uh, little zodiacs with one other yeah. person. You could go with a partner, right? So I was paired with a, another artist who was there at the same time as me, and we would go out together in the boat, and then we would land the boat, and then we would split up and do our own thing, and then make a plan to meet back. But that mm -hmm. said, even I'm working with sound, so I was wanting to get away from the human sounds in Antarctica, but there was still a lot, right? Just like with the visual you have, you can see really far away. Um, there were times when the sound would just travel across the water. And so I could, I'd be, you know, miles away and I'd hear the diesel generators that are powering the station. I'm like, oh, um, or I love someone it else down. is driving a boat around and you're like, oh, just need that boat to go by before I can record the sound. <laughs> like, I love that sound of the diesel generators. That, you um, loved um, it? <laughs> it's, uh, I, I videoed it, I filmed it, I used it as a soundtrack because it's just so the machine. It's just the pulsing <laughs> heart of this human presence in that place. It's just diesel. You know, it's <laughs> it it's is. it's fascinating. And the other thing is, you think it's going to be totally clean. They have flags everywhere, right? Flags for different functions. I mean, it's just like there's like black sticks for oil. I don't know, blue sticks for for maybe petrol. You know, red. There's like all of these flags everywhere, saying that there are that there are lines underneath the roads. It's very structured. You can go where these flags are, but not where these flags are. And that's the yellow flag. And it was just like, really? Because you're trying to control biohazard, you know? The answer yeah. is to stick a yellow stick, I mean, a yellow some, flag. Some stations where I visited in the dry valleys, you were not supposed to leave any waste. So very interesting. Um, I was stuck for a while in the dry valleys because they couldn't come and pick us up. Uh, the weather in McMurdo was so bad. And while I was stuck there at that station, I had hiked over the Canada Glacier with a young man uh, because you can't go on your own. And we were, we, I, that was a seven, eight hour hike. That was amazing. Um, and we were stuck in the most beautiful place and the weather there was beautiful. So we got to go out on these walks and we came across penguins, dead penguins and, and, and some seals that had like gone the wrong direction. Like sometimes they lose their sense of you know, orientation and they go into the dry valleys instead of the ocean. So you find these, uh, you know, skeletons of uh, animals that shouldn't be there. Um, so that was an amazing experience with various lakes. And I, this was Lake Hoare, it's called. I was at Lake Frixel first with the scientists, then we hiked over Canada Glacier to Lake Hoare to a much bigger station that had these incinerating toilets and uh, where you could actually take a shower by standing in this room where they gave you two gallons of water in a bag and you got to like, you had to reserve the room and you had this view of the glacier. It was, the whole thing was in incredible and magical. So that was a very memorable, memorable few days there. Cool. <laughs> between between the, this incredible landscape that I was in and then this weird incinerators. And it's, it's so disorienting, you know, the whole, so just yeah. asking about the experience, just very, very odd in many ways. I would utterly second that. Actually, I think it's great, Judith, yeah. because that is what it is actually like. We can romanticize yeah, it's these very weird, pure yeah. environments, but actually your experience of Antarctica is not pure, no. you know, and that nothing nothing is pure. No. And that, and I actually think it's great to hear that because it is, it is a colonized place. We got, we were given like a glossary of all of the terms and the acronyms that are used in Antarctica in the U.S. Antarctic program, and they're they're all very militaristic. Well, the organization you fly in, in a C seventeen or whatever. You fly in in a military plane that's fully gutted, you know, mm -hmm. so it doesn't have any like like you just see all the cables running through it. You're all sitting there in these huge like space suits and like with a whole lot of military people. It's very very disarming for somebody that's not from that culture. Yeah, there was no heat. There is no heat on the, those planes. So you, you have to have your whole gear on. You're sitting on the plane thinking, holy <laughs> moly, they're saying if you crash, you have to walk out and all this gear. <laughs> like, it is, in fact, a lot like going to the moon. Yeah. <laughs> I imagine it might be. You're very looked after, very looked after. Mm -hmm. They're very anxious about their artists. They're like, they, they, 
you're a little bit they want to they don't want a dead hands. artist on their hands no. <laughs> yeah, pull down a little hole how, how does an artist be... get to go to antarctica it's an application uh, process yeah yeah it's a proposal process and it's pretty elaborate can you tell us a little bit about the is it the aaw collective i can yes i can tell you about that i one of the founding members. So it's a group of alumni from the US Antarctic Artists and Writers Program. Um, so we're just looking at ways that, we all had individual projects, but we're looking at ways that we can work together to share Antarctica and our work with a larger audience and also to sort of foster new collaborations. Uh, but there's this woman, Elaine Hood, who works in logistics for the U.S. Antarctic program, and she was like, she was very instrumental in kind of bringing a core group of uh, 13 Antarctic artists together to about two years ago-ish. So we had a little reunion, um, and we were all like, yes, we should do something together. And I've been a part of many conversations like this before, but it's never really gone anywhere. Uh, but in this case, it, it did. And so now there's, there's a website and there's just a lot going on with that. How did you get to exhibit or be involved with the Antarctica as an artist? And So New Zealand has a residency program. Uh, a lot of artists will, will um, bounce through Christchurch to get to, um, to get to the ice anyway I have um good friends that have gone through the American program yeah I I, I, I was shooting daguerreotypes um so they really went out of use in about 1860 so, so there had been an attempt to take daguerreotype plates to Antarctica but those particular explorative journeys in the late 19th century never made it to the ice so it had never been Im Im implemented or employed as a technology so sort of, you know, large format. Um, I was shooting some other stuff as well, but making that work. And how were the results of the images that you created? The results were, yeah, pretty fascinating, I think. Yeah, in their own way. What is appropriate or, or looking, when you see the, some of the art that some of the hundred artists make and you might kind of think, well, uh, you know, um, Miss moving items you know when you when you go to antarctica for me it would feel like almost like a like a shrine like of 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 like you know like i can i can understand from uh cheryl's point of view wanting to uh you know not not uh not change the environment but to somehow record it and encapsulate it in, into your work or whatever we are actually part of the world and we are deeply part of the world and part of the and obviously if you're talking about land artists or artists generally dealing with ecology we're right there uh ethically having to you know unpack that but but for me as an academic travel is the it's the thing I've really really got to own New Zealand artists are constantly moving around going to Antarctica is a huge huge carbon dump I don't think yeah. it's ethical but but on the other hand you know I had a conversation with scientists there who are like look we're doing all this work and it is not communicating people are not getting it you know we want you here so but yeah. but but yeah I mean you know the the conversation about moving the rocks as opposed to the <laughs> carbon invested in the journey to move yeah. the rocks seems you know yeah. just out of whack you know to be to be staunch about it because I'm an educator you know and I I, I feel like you know we've got to get yeah. to that real <clears throat> the nub of the question yeah and that's the calculus isn't it you know making it impactful enough to be worth it and we all have to engage in that calculus <laughs> so obviously uh the academia absolutely encourages us to travel it's built into our um research obligations and yeah. our art practice and our research obligations are entangled so how can i make how can i build enough into this how well, not right it now, Joyce, it though, it it's, it's really changing in this new world. And I think that people are realizing how much can be done like this, yeah. Uh, yeah. which, you know, I think this is going, this is maybe one of the silver linings, um, yeah. but I think people are realizing how much can be achieved like this. It's been incredible. I mean, conferences that I would never have been able to attend because I'm not in academia. I can now 
go and listen to a lecture online from the UK or, or you know, the other side of the world. And that that's great. And that's going to be really advantageous for the future of, mm-hmm. of everything to have the knowledge um, more widely spread and have more voices involved in, in talking about these issues. I want to bring to attention also Ursula Le Guin's uh, short story, Sir, but it's about this group of women who make it to Antarctica from South America before all the male explorers make it there. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a, obviously a fiction, but uh, they arrive in the early 1900s. I don't know what year exactly, but before Scott and the others. And they basically go unnoticed because they leave no trace. So anything they do there, they make with like they make ice sculptures that then melt. So, so I think both of you as land artists would really enjoy this book uh, because of everything we're talking about, but also um, also making art from what's there. In this case, ice. Um, just recommendation. And, and, like I've I've seen some of your your installations and your figures, like, and, and in particular, uh, um, like the climate kind of action seems to be part of the narrative, would that be right? Yes, yeah, so I, um, before I went to Antarctica, actually I began um, a narrative that weaves around the objects or, or what I've made. And I, I'm inclined to make less and less. <laughs> and and uh, the storytelling has taken over, but whatever I do make, which is you know also scale-wise and every way getting smaller and smaller, that's my way of, <laughs> of <laughs> retiring you know, um, material impact. I'm, get, I'm getting to be a miniaturist, but um, basically, and, and that's probably an inclination of mine anyway. Um, uh, I've woven a story of an unknown explorer who goes to Antarctica in 1939, a woman uh, incognito disguised as a man. Her name is Anna Schwartz. And the, the story is very layered because it's of course brings in associations to the Second World War and what is actually going on in Europe from where she's coming from. Uh, Lisa Bloom has written a lot about this this particular um, narrative um, because it has so many different layers, but what's woven in there is the ocean acidification story as it affects calcifying organisms, where I'm actually right now also engaged actively in a project through the Getty uh, Pacific Standard Time. I'm uh, one of a team of people working on one of those um, grants uh, for, for a 2024 exhibition and a book project, uh, which has to do with oceanography and, and so on. But anyway, just to return, the storytelling has become very big and um, uh, uh, whatever I make, I make in the name of my protagonist. So if I do make something, it's usually my protagonists that are making it for someone in the story or for each oh. other, for themselves. So the way that it's presented and actually I love this medium for it. So I've like realized this is my medium. <laughs> Um, it's it's the images and the text together that's the art really i mean that conversation about the ethics of land art i haven't had that conversation with uh land artists yet never mind you know here we are on other sides of the world having that conversation and comparing uh notes so that's a beautiful thing great well thank you all for your time great cool see so, you next thank time thank you very much Thank you. Lovely to meet you all. What a pleasure. Okay, take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.